I have to say that sitting here next to these guys who've done so much incredible work on this case um, very much makes me the voice from the peanut gallery. But I will try to do at least pose questions for discussion. Um, I think part of what makes this case so compelling is that when you look at the facts that they've just walked us through, you can't help but have this like incredibly strong gut reaction that this is a tragedy and it's a travesty and obviously justice, any kind of just outcome requires that there be compensation from the victims, like period. Um, especially they deserve to have the UN acknowledge the harm that was caused and to have an apology. Um, and you know, we've heard that the UN has like maybe a little bit done that thanks to the lawsuits. They're still far to go. Um, but when you sort of go from thinking about the facts of this case to trying to use this as a lens to think about some of the broader systemic challenges of international law and accountability structures, um, the picture potentially gets muddier. And so what my co-authors on the paper and I wanted to do was sort of first to um, think a little bit about the limits of law and, and the idea of legalism. Um, and then to think about both legal and non-legal pathways to accountability, practically speaking, given the international legal system that we have. Um, so in mainstream international relations theory, at least, there's this tendency to view law as a progressive instrument, to see law as a means of constraining powerful <laughs> actors and of holding them accountable. Um, and that's really only half the story. In reality, law is a set of boundaries, and those boundaries define positive space, but they also define negative space, inevitably. Um, in creating accountability, law also creates the absence of accountability. Um, and in awarding standing to some, it denies standing to others. And it goes without saying, or it should go without saying, <laughs> that these boundaries that are created by law don't map onto right or wrong, um, or just or unjust, but, Judith Sklar, who's a really prominent legal scholar, um, tells us actually that it absolutely needs to be said because she argues that um, the power of law in our society and in our, in our imagination is such that we tend to conflate what's legal and what's just in both directions. So um, in the first place, we see that law, there is sort of the first, the best, the preferential road to justice goes through the courts. Um, if we see a wrong, we want to be able to sue to make it right, right? And the more outraged we are by the wrong, the more we want to be able to sue to make it right. Because having that legal judgment um, is an institutional legitimation and validation of the grievance suffered, and it's a really powerful one. At the same time, we are socialized more or less to believe that the legal outcome is the just outcome by virtue of it being the legal outcome. Um, so that law becomes a proxy for justice as opposed to one of several of a set of tools that we can use to pursue justice. And sometimes a case like this comes along and it cracks through that socialization. And you get the sort of Dickensian reaction that we quoted in the paper, well, like, if that's what the law says, then the law is an ass. But um, what's more important to sort of realize is that the way the law is operating in this case isn't unusual. It's not an aberration. Um, this idea that law can be used to shield from accountability as well as to hold people accountable is a feature. It's not a bug. Um, and so when we try to think about finding legal remedies for legal gaps and accountability, we have to recognize that we're also inherently creating more gaps, right? Like, and kind of approach this with a bit of caution. Um, so with that in mind, we in the paper present sort of four potential pathways um, to legal accountability in a case like this. Um, two are pretty straightforward and the second two are a little bit less so, so I'll go through them quickly. Um, the first is to think about the legal standing of states versus individuals, which both Bia and Mona mentioned yesterday. Um, hypoth like as, as they sort of talked about, there were virtually no legal avenues open to the cholera victims in this case. Hypothetically, the Haitian government had several options that it could have pursued. Um, and that is how international law works. There's sort of this 
two-tiered um, accountability structure where IOs are accountable to governments and there is an assumption that governments are accountable to their citizens. Of course, in practice, this is like brutally ironic and unrealistic because the places where the UN is most likely to be active are precisely those places where the government is going to lack the capacity or the autonomy or the political will to be able to advocate on behalf of their citizens. So the answer then is to give, you know, sort of increase the options for legal standing of individuals. Um, and we're slowly moving in that direction, uh, especially in some areas of human rights law. It's kind of two steps forward, one step back. Um, the second option would be to draft new law that limits the immunity of international organizations. Um, and as Admi mentioned a little bit this morning, there are some proposals that do that floating around the Dario. Uh, there are other proposals for new treaty law that could be amended to do this. So things like the Framework Convention on Global Health. Um, there's also the possibility of creating extra legal dispute resolution mechanisms. But obviously there are significant obstacles to this path as well. Um, the present international environment is not very conducive to the development of new international law. I was interviewing someone in WHO's legal counsel office uh, who said that at this point, if you try to bring up treaty law at the World Health Assembly, like even the building itself groans. <laughs> so um, the third and fourth pathway raise some sort of practical and normative questions that I don't have good answers to, honestly, so I'm just going to put them out there. Um, there is a potential role for domestic courts, so not sort of international law in domestic courts, not national law. Um, and this is the role or the pathway that initially the lawsuits that these guys filed took. Um, the lawsuit asked US federal courts to pierce UN immunity. It's something that US courts haven't done in the past, um, and the US government filed briefs asking them not to do. And had the courts done so, it would have been really a rather activist move. Um, essentially sort of reinterpreting the Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the UN because that convention says that the UN is explicitly immune from suit in domestic courts unless it explicitly waives that immunity. So honestly, given the facts of this case, um, a lot of people's first reaction, my first reaction, is to say, okay, fine, just do it. But um, abstractly, there's reason to think about whether this is a precedent that we want to set. Um, practically speaking, is this a feasible role for national courts to play? Normatively, is it a role that we're comfortable having national courts play? And if we're comfortable having US courts or EU courts play this role, what about other countries' courts? And if we're comfortable having them do this with respect to UN immunity, what about other forms of diplomatic immunity? Um, the fourth issue, the fourth pathway, is, relates to the prospects for implementing judgments. Um, yesterday, we touched on the idea that principal agent relationships structure accountability. And IOs are agents of their member states. Um, and in some ways, they're pretty constrained, especially financially, their autonomy is pretty constrained. So if we're talking about IO accountability, there naturally arises a second order question, which is that if an IO is held accountable or accepts responsibility, does that automatically redound to its member states? If so, how do we make that happen? What kind of mechanisms exist or would need to exist to transfer liability? Um, and if not, does that effectively make the UN judgment proof, at least if you're talking about large sums of money? Um, we see sort of the, the latest indignity in the cholera case is that the UN has admitted responsibility. It has established this fund for treatment uh, and infrastructure and compensating victims. The fund was endorsed by member states. There was a $400 million goal. They've raised $4.6 million. That's it. Um, the New York Times editorial board wrote this really blistering editorial calling on the Secretary General to, quote, compel member states uh, to give money. Um, there's a problem with that, which is that I'm sure the Secretary General would love to have the authority to compel member states to do anything. He doesn't. Um, he can't even repurpose money without permission. So there's this $40 million that's left over from the peacekeeping fund, which is shutting down. They've asked for the money to be reallocated to this fund, and member states are opposing it. This is totally appalling and totally unsurprising. Um, so sort of where that leaves us um, is to think about uh, 
In addition to legal accountability, there are all of these other forms that exist. There's financial accountability, which also goes often goes hand in hand with legal accountability, but doesn't necessarily need to. There's political accountability. There's moral accountability, which again, we have a tendency to conflate with legal accountability, but they're not the same thing, and this is what Schlar warns us against. Um, and all of these frames for accountability have their advantages and limitations, and they interfere with each other. And sometimes that interference is constructive, and sometimes it's destructive. Um, and so some of the questions that we raised in the paper and that I sort of would leave you with is, you know, how do we decide what frames to employ? Um, what follows that choice? So do we preclude others? How do they build on others? What are the pros and cons of using different frames? And is, are those like pros and cons necessarily case specific or are there sort of more general principles that we can draw? Um, and this lawsuit gives us one really interesting set of answers in the way that they use strategic litigation to um, ultimately elicit other forms of accountability, which they've done you know, unbelievably well. This is sort of the, the case in point. Um, but it's a bold strategy for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that historically, this legal frame hasn't been the main way of going after the UN, right? The UN has a long history of causing harms that have never been legalized. So oil for food example. Um, we've talked about that actually achieving legal accountability is a really hard thing to do, even sort of when you have the facts on your side. Um, there's also the question of sort of the legal frame engendering fear of financial liability and of establishing a formal precedent, which can then inhibit progress towards other forms of accountability. Um, given the, the extent of the UN's immunity, effectively it needs to come to the table of its own accord. And um, adopting a legal frame in that case is potentially self-defeating because like everybody knows that when you call a defense lawyer, the first thing the defense lawyer does is tell his client to shut up. So. The bigger and the bigger the price tag, the bigger a risk this is. Um, the third problem is that uh, the absence of a legal judgment or the absence of the ability to get a legal judgment can, may diffuse or deflect political or moral pressure for accountability. Um, and this goes back to the danger that I talked about earlier, where law and legalism or and legality becomes a proxy for right or wrong. So if you invite people to think about this in legal terms and then you can't get the legal judgment, do you then, do they have a get out of jail free card? Can they get off the hook and just say, well, you know, the court didn't find us guilty, we didn't do anything wrong. Um, in principle, this shouldn't be the case, but it's really hard to scale back once you've sort of set that up as the, the objective, the bar. Um, so as I said, thanks to their skillful handling, those dangers didn't manifest in this case. Um, but given that they're there in others, I think it's incumbent upon us to think carefully about when this strategy of strategic litigation can be replicated. Are there contexts in which it might not be replicable? Um, are there contexts in which it could backfire? And then are there other ways of eliciting political and moral accountability and what are the costs and benefits of those? <laughs>